Hi, Teardown Time again today. What we've got today is this. Um, this is a radio sonde. These are used by meteorologists for measuring uh, weather conditions. Um, this thing is basically strapped onto a big helium or hydrogen balloon, sent up into the atmosphere, and it monitors temperature, pressure, wind speed, humidity, uh, and then transmits that back. Um, there's a GPS receiver in here to um, monitor both its position and also wind speed by the, you know, the distance that it's moving. Comes in nice. nice... Uh, moisture proof uh, gold bag. I think that's mainly just to um, keep the humidity sensor stable so it's um, the, yeah, they don't drift over time so it's a nice uh, dry atmosphere. Um, this is the battery it uses. It's a very unusual type of battery. Um, there are options, there are actually sort of alkaline and lithium options for this but because this is effectively a one-time use sort of disposable piece of kit because the chances are you're unlikely to actually find it again afterwards um, because it's probably going to land in the sea. This is a water activated battery um, it's effectively it's, um, a battery with no electrolyte. Um, the idea is that you, you dunk this in water for a few minutes before it um, before you plug it in. Because obviously these things are designed for a single use uh, for a very finite amount of time. Um, it's a fairly unusual application for batteries, so this has got sort of porous material and, and electrodes. One of the reasons for using this type of battery is that it doesn't contain any toxic heavy metals, because a lot of these things are going to end up sort of in the ocean or just sort of landing in random places, so you don't really want to be dumping anything toxic anywhere. The battery's got this um, foam polystyrene um, insert, and there's also polystyrene here. This is to maintain the uh, battery temperature, because obviously as this thing goes up to high altitudes, um, it gets pretty cold, and battery performance reduces quite substantially, and obviously with a water-activated battery, at some point it's going to freeze. So this polystyrene just keeps the battery at sensible temperature for... I think these things normally only run for like a couple of hours, so it just needs to maintain its temperature for that long. And this is the thing that attaches it to the balloon. I think um, the balloon's what it's hooked onto there, and there's this thread, which are, uh, the idea is I think you sort of launch the balloon, you let the, let the balloon go up and it sort of unwinds itself so you don't get any tangle of wire, and then of um, string rather, and then the, the thing lifts off and um, does its thing. I think it's about 30 metres. I don't quite know why there's such a long... Um, a long drop from the balloon. I'm sure there's, there's some good reason for it. I can't immediately think what that would be. If you look at the um, unit itself, um, this is the antenna. This, see, this one transmits on um, around 400 megahertz. There's a, a band allocated specifically for um, this application. So this is a, like a, a quarter wave antenna, about 200 millimeter long um, wire for that, that stage. On the top here, um, this is the GPS antenna. It's a sort of helical design because the GPS signals are have a, a rotational polarisation. Um, the main reason for that is so that the if they get reflected off of something, when they get reflected, the rotation changes so that the receiver won't pick up the reflection, which might give a false reading. These are the main external sensors. This is a temperature sensor. This is actually a very fine piece of wire in here. I, was, I did a, look, a bit of reading. I found the data sheet for this. And this is actually a capacitive temperature sensor. There's a very tiny piece of ceramic inside a, um, a glass bead inside here. I'm not totally sure the exact reasons for, do, for using that rather than something like a thermistor. Obviously, these things do need to be quite accurate. Um, the reason this is all silvered is that you don't want the, your, your, what you want to be measuring is the air temperature, you don't want it to be affected by sunlight. So this is a very highly reflective surface. Also it's on a very thin wire to avoid any heat conduction from the body um, to the actual sensing element. So it's, you know, it's sensing just air temperature and nothing else. And down here there's two humidity sensors. I'm not entirely sure of the reason for having two of them. I believe these are actually heated. I'll stick these under a microscope to take a closer look. But these are... Um, I think there's like a film on them that uh, reacts to the humidity and that's then sensed. Um, humidity sensors are quite often um, capacitive. But we'll have a play around with those to, to um, see if we can figure out what's, uh, what's, what's going on with those. And it's just a long plastic case. Um, so there's this polystyrene layer to insulate the battery. I was taking apart an, an older one of these a few years ago and that the whole thing was actually made out of polystyrene. And on the bottom here there's a couple of ports. There's a, an edge connector there for connection and there's also um, a pin header. I'm a little bit surprised about a pin header because obviously if you're trying to make something really cheap, if it's, if it's expendable, the edge connector is obviously going to be the cheapest type of connector because there's no parts. But I'd, um, they've also got this pin connector which obviously costs the money to fit. I'm not entirely sure the exact use of those. And when you launch these there is like a test station that you use uh, when you're launching these. One of the things it does is it conditions and calibrates the, sent the um, humidity sensor in particular but it will also do things like program the radio channel that's used, used and um, there's probably some ID programming so that when you've got a lot of these lying around you know which one's where. Right, I'll take this lid off. Um, you can't see a great deal here. Just obviously the 
a few random bunches of chips. There's a um, provision for a shielding can on this side that's not fitted. There's a shielding can um, on the other side. Right, let's get this shielding can off. Right, on this side there's a couple of modules. I imagine um, there's quite a few options on this thing. So the um, all the sensors go go onto this little board, and I'm sure there's probably different permutations of this for measuring different different things. But yeah, this is actually the RF stakes. The, the antennas connected to this top board. So again, there may well be different options of this depending on the, the range. I believe this is about 60 milliwatt transmitter. Um, but again, there's almost certainly different options, maybe for using different countries, different power levels, frequencies and so on. It's interesting, it looks like these don't look like they've actually been sold. I think these are probably a press fit. So again, they can easily can customise these things by, li by sort of just, probably just pushing these, pressing these, probably with a press tool. But if we pull that, yeah, that, that is actually coming out. There's no solder at all on there. They've just been push fitted into a an accurately sized hole so you can actually get that out but that's a, it's very stiff so I'm sure they've probably got some special jig or something to uh, press those down and again same thing on the uh, RF box Right, this is the transmitter board. This looks reasonably straightforward. Um, there's a um, custom chip here. It's just, it just says TX1B um, VLSI Finland. The actual manufacturer of this radio sound is um, Vaisala, who are based in Finland. So it's not surprising they're using Finnish uh, custom chip manufacturer. Um, there's no crystal on here. It must be getting a frequency reference from the. Um, there's a crystal on the uh, GPS. Board, so that must be where the frequency reference is coming from for the transmitter. So this is probably a, a synthesizer. Um, that chip, that's just a voltage regulator. So that's going to be providing a stable voltage for the transmitter stage. Um, but other than that, it's just a fairly uh, standard uh, RF transmitter. Nothing particularly uh, exciting there. You can see a few um, PCB inductors there on the PCB track. But other than that, it's uh, nothing particularly exciting. Right, this is this base and GPS board. Um, that's a 256k bit serial flash chip, so that's going to have the um, the firmware for this DSP chip. This looks like a custom job, so it says VSI, VLSI Finland. I couldn't find any reference to the um, part number DSP IC or 1C, so this will almost certainly be a custom device. Um, the GPS section here, we've got uh, a filter at the front end, some various sort of amplifier stuff, and this chip. Um, I couldn't find any information on this, but it's a company called UNAV, so I'm sure that's just a deep GPS RF front end chip that then feeds the data to this. Now, um, I'm not sure of the details of this one, but certainly an old, a very old um, radio sign I took apart a while ago. What they seem to be doing is not actually doing the full GPS decoding on board, because obviously with GPS what you're doing is you're receiving effectively time signals from a number of different satellites and then working out your position based on the relative differences in those time signals. So um, obviously this unit itself doesn't actually need to know where it is. It's, it's the receiving station that does. So on this other one, you could tell by how little electronics there was, what they were doing is they were receiving the GPS signal and actually just sending that raw data out so that the base station could then take that timing information and calculate the position from it just to save the, the cost and possibly power consumption of doing the GPS decoding on the actual unit. Now, I don't know whether this does that or not. Okay, yeah, there's not enough information to see. I mean, obviously GPS has become a lot simpler and cheaper um, to do these days, so maybe it has got a full GPS decoder. Um, I'm not really sure. I suppose one option might be to fire it up and see if there's any, because if there is a GPS decoder, it may well be spitting out um, NMEA data somewhere. So it might be worth just firing it up and having a quick poke around with the scope, which I might do in a minute. But um, the only other thing, other thing on here is just a, voltage, a linear voltage regulator. Uh, there's a triple one seven adjust, adjustable regulator on there, which is already set to a specific voltage. Um, <clears throat> not really anything else of any interest. So you've got this this edge connector and also the um, 
this pin header on there, so I'm not really quite sure why they, they have both. Unless might, perhaps one of these might be for some optional extra sensors, perhaps there's some other sensors that you can plug into it for doing um, different types of measurements. Right, this is the um, measurement sensing board. There's a chip here. I couldn't find any reference to this part number MAS1008, so that could be a custom or it could just be a microcontroller with a custom marking. Um, this will be the uh, barometric pressure sensor. Now, interesting here, we've got this diode with this fairly big lump of what looks like copper wrap around it. Now, I'm pretty sure that's going to be more to do with temperature than shielding. And what I suspect this is, this is probably um, temperature compensating the characteristics of the sensor. This sensor, uh, this sort of pressure sensor, is usually a silicon uh, strain gauge bridge type device. And um, one problem with those is they do have quite a substantial temperature coefficient. So uh, I, I'm guessing this is either directly compensating it or measuring the temperature at the same point as the sensor so it can then be compensated in software. One slightly odd thing about this board, there are a few tracks where they've left the resist off. Now this, this hasn't fallen off, fallen off the, the, you can actually see by the, the, um, the border, the, they've very deliberately left off the solder resist on a few specific tracks. Now I don't really understand what reason you'd have for doing that. Yeah, it seems to be just a few sort of fairly random tracks in there, it just sort of does it and then it sort of carries on normally. So um don't really know what that's about, but it does seem to be deliberate if you look at but nothing else particularly interesting on here. So there's um FFC connector here they're using to connect to the actual um sensing thing. This is clearly obviously a custom flex assembly here. So we've seen we've got the um this thin wire temperature sensor and we've got these two humidity sensors I don't quite know why they use two of them um, but you can actually see there's some sort of staking patterns which I believe is a heater so it uh, controls it to a specific temperature and there's also um, a sensing element on there Uh, there's also a blob, I'm not sure if there's a chip under this blob or whether this is something else. Let's have a go at a strong bit flex the plastic. Yeah, there is a chip under here. Um, what I suspect that might be, can't quite see how many wires are going for it, that could maybe be a, a thermistor for ad additional temperature sensing. Um, the other thing I thought it might be, but I don't think there's enough pins, it could be an E-squared prop to hold calibration data for the sensor, but it looks like it's only got two pins, so I think that might just be a thermistor or possibly a reference capacitor for these capacitive sensors. And the fact it's got this super shiny coating on it would probably suggest that it, it's a temperature sensor and that doesn't want to be affected by sunlight. And yeah, this does look like a thermistor if I... Um just warm it up a bit with the soldering iron, you can see the resistance shoots down, so that's clearly a temperature sensor. Now these humidity sensors are usually capacitive, so I'm just going to hook up my cheap crappy capacitance meter across one of them. Well, it's seeing about 36 picofarads, and if I just breathe on it to increase the humidity, you should see it increase. There you go. Um, I don't know whether they use this heater to actually improve the efficiency of the central just to stabilise it um, but so there's that little carbon heater on there but I can't really bother um, heating that up to try it. Mm, unfortunately I managed to break this um, thin wire temperature sensor before I could do any measurements on it so um, its characteristics will remain a mystery. Right, this is what's inside the pressure sensor. These things are usually something like a sort of silicon diaphragm sort of strain gauge type arrangement because um, this is an absolute sensor. One side will be at a vacuum and the other will be at the um, external pressure although I can't actually see where the input port is on. This is probably, probably a tiny tiny little hole somewhere to uh, let the, uh, the pressure in but I can't actually see where it is on this thing. Let's see, oh, maybe it's that the tiny little dot there. So this thing's so small it's very hard to see. It could be that little uh, a little dot there perhaps. Well, actually, take a look at this, this um, water activated battery. It looks like we've actually got two batteries wired in parallel so I think I'm going to activate one of them and keep the other one dry to take apart so it's a bit, a bit less uh, messy but uh, let's give this a dunk and see what happens.
Right, it's done this thing in which showing the voltage here and I've got the other meter so I can measure its short circuit current. So uh, let's get it wet. And so almost immediately it goes up to about four and a half volts. And you can just about see the uh, the water soaking into this white um, stuff in there. Up. It's up to about 7 volts. Let's see what sort of current we get out of it. Almost nothing. About 50 milliamp short circuit current. Um, documentation says to leave it in there for a few minutes. Seems to be stabilising out at around the 7 volt sort of figure. Yeah, I'll say, yeah so we're only getting about 50 milliamp short circuit current. Um, try giving it a slightly more sensible load. Just take a 100 ohm load across it, so that'll be 6 volts, It'll be about 60 milliamps. Yeah, it's dropping to about half, so it looks like the internal impedance is something of the order of 100 ohms. About 5 volts, that's about 25 milliamps, so yeah, it looks like it's probably designed for something around the 25 milliamp sort of uh, region. Just take a quick look inside this other one. Fairly sort of traditional battery construction. We've got a metal plate on the end, some sort of slightly powdery electrolyte material, then this sort of mem absorbent membrane. Then another metal plate on the other side. And so it's about six cells in series. So, very primitive battery technology, but it does the job and presumably doesn't, it doesn't contain heavy metals. Not quite sure what that is, it's quite soft, maybe zinc or something. Well, I've tried firing this thing up with some power, but I can't get it to do anything vaguely useful. Um, it may be that it needs to be plugged into that ground station box before it will do anything, or it could just be that I broke something in the process of... Um, taking it apart. Um, I did read, take off this um, chip, it's a 256k but E squared prom and read it and there's a whole load of what looks like code but there's no text or any obvious messages of any sort on there so um don't think there's anything else I can usually do for that but um, it's another piece of rather different unusual tech. Right, maybe there's some radio sond enthusiasts out there that can help me, help me with this. A long time ago, when I was very young, I don't know, maybe seven or eight or something, my uncle gave me an old radio sond that he'd found that had landed in his garden. Um, I, I'd be just quite interested to sort of find out if there's any information about this thing on the net or anything. It's a very old unit, it's maybe sort of 20 or 30 years old. Um, it was like a cylindrical case, I think it was something like cardboard, and I think it was silver or grey. Uh, something like six inches diameter to 12 inches high. Uh, but it was used, used valves, there was about three or four valves in it. The whole bottom had some sort of, like the battery was this whole bottom area here, it was like a, this cylindrical which split in two and would, would sort of lift apart. I think the top maybe had a slight dome or a curve on it. Um, and on the side it had this sort of anemometer type, type thing. And this actually drove internally, there was like a circular cam type arrangement, so that as the wind blew, this thing would rotate and connect. I think there was about three different instruments around the side in like external cans. There was, um, there was a humid humidity thing which used some sort of stretch membrane. I assume there was also a temperature, maybe a temp I think there was a, um, uh, some sort of like board and gauge type uh, pressure thing as well, but this thing would actually rotate this cam and connect the instruments in turn to transmit the data via, via this valve circuitry. I'd be really interested to know if anyone's got any information about um, radio sons of that era, because I'd just you know, now be quite interested in the technical details of it that I obviously didn't understand at the age when I actually got the thing and ripped it to pieces.